SpaceX resumed Starship Super Heavy 24-7 testing at the launch site. NASA and the scientific community is getting super serial about the possibility it provides. Elon and T-Mobile team up. A lot of Starlink missions are happening. And we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. Early Tuesday morning, Booster 7 was finally moved out of the Mega Bay after receiving its Center 13 Raptor engines and transported down Highway 4 in Boca Chica, Texas to the launch site, perhaps for the final time before the orbital flight. And now that her absence has created more room in the Mega Bay, crews have begun installing aerial walkways inside it. Hours later, the Super Heavy booster was groped by the tower's giant chopsticks, like a piece of sea meat, hoisted into the air and placed in the mouth of the orbital launch mount. Elon shared a close encounter of the event. The following day, the Edom test tank vacated the area and was returned to sender after not being tested at all during its time at the launch site. But after weeks of upgrading components for Stage 0, like adding shielding to suborbital Pad B, Booster 7 and Ship 24 resumed testing on Wednesday, both executing igniter tests. And Starship even got some cryo all up in its tank. Then on Thursday, B7 performed a couple spin prime maneuvers on a few of its newly installed Raptor 2 engines. Check out Lab Padre's Predator Cam of the second spin up. Labs cams also captured S24 spinning up a few hours later, and it appears SpaceX also tested Pad B's deluge system. More possible closures for possible static fires continue next week. Elon tweeted that one of the main goals for 2022 is putting Starship in Earth orbit. Will require insane work by many super talented people, but if anyone can do it, they can. You can do it! A piece written for Science this month by Sarah Scholes notes that many in the space science community are also starting to believe SpaceX can do it and will be watching these orbital flights closely to see if Starship will indeed be the key that unlocks endless possibilities for future scientific research in space at a much cheaper price than what's currently being offered in the industry. Scientists are preparing themselves while urging counterparts at NASA to be ready to take advantage of the new capabilities as well. It seems at the moment NASA is focusing more on Artemis. Last Friday, the agency held a media teleconference about the Artemis 3 mission and revealed they have identified 13 candidate landing regions for the Starship Lunar Lander, called the Human Landing System, near the South Pole. Quote, several of the proposed sites within the regions are located among some of the oldest parts of the moon and together with the permanently shadowed regions, provide the opportunity to learn about the history of the moon through previously unstudied lunar materials, said Artemis Lunar Science Lead for NASA's Planetary Science Division, Sarah Noble. The sites also have enough sunlight throughout a six and a half day mission period that fulfill the completion of moonwalk objectives, but they will have to be level enough to allow Starship HLS to land. NASA said that's for SpaceX to figure out. During the conference, NASA said after Artemis 2 is complete, SpaceX will need to perform an uncrewed HLS test. That will involve landing on the moon with a skeleton Starship. That is to say, one that doesn't necessarily have to take back off from the lunar surface. And all of this culminates in late 2025 with our Artemis 3 flight, which will be our first Artemis crewed lunar landing, marking the first time a woman will walk on the moon, and also the first time we humans have visited the South Pole region. Will NASA please define what a woman is for us? To get the first biological whammon to the moon, SpaceX will first launch a fuel depot to Earth orbit and then launch Starship tankers to fill it up. That's how Starship HLS will get the propellant it needs to get to the moon. Once there, the Artemis 3 crew in an Orion capsule will dock with HLS, which will then take them down to the lunar surface at the South Pole. After about a week of doing work inside and outside of HLS, Starship will lift off, dock back with Orion in lunar orbit, transfer the crew, which will then splash down off the San Diego coast. Also on Friday, SpaceX launched another 53 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Florida. This was the fifth and sixth flight for these fairing halves. Elon twatting each half on its own is a fully capable re-entry vehicle with its own thrusters, thermal protection, avionics, and sensor suite. Not to mention their own recovery system using shoots bra. This was the Falcon 9 booster's ninth flight, landing dead center on a shortfall of gravitas bobbing on the Atlantic. And yet another Starlink launch will take place before SLS takes off from the Cape on Monday, if it does launch on Monday. SpaceX is targeting Saturday at 10.22 p.m. Eastern for liftoff of 54 Starsats from Slick 40. And last night, Elon and T-Mobile's president, Mike Sievert, held a public update at Starbase Texas to announce, quote, a technology alliance. A technology alliance that we call coverage above and beyond. In a nutshell, Starlink version 2 satellites, equipped with huge antennas, will launch on Starship next year so T-Mobile customers can use Starlink service on their existing phones to text or make calls in dead zones, thus eliminating all dead zones around the United States, including surrounding oceans, and possibly beyond if carriers and other nations get in on this. However, Elon was very clear that you won't have a strong enough signal to live stream or even stream videos on your phones, at least not in the near future. 
Now this, this, this won't have the kind of bandwidth that a Starlink terminal would have, but it, it will enable texting, it, it will enable uh, I images, and if, you're, if, you're, if there aren't too many people in, this, in the cell zone, you could even potentially have a little bit of video. So the, the important thing about this is that it, it means there's no dead zones anywhere in the world for your cell phone. On August 19th, SpaceX submitted an electronic filing with the Federal Communications Commission to facilitate expeditious authorization and deployment of Gen 2 Starlink satellites to benefit American consumers and businesses as quickly as possible, which includes using both Starship and Falcon 9 to rocket these new Starlinks to space. To make this happen, SpaceX will tailor the second-gen satellites to fit inside Falcon's fairing by moving components around on the spacecraft, but they will still contain the same hardware as those that will fly on Starship. But with that being said, Elon clarified during yesterday's update that using Falcon 9 is only a backup plan. The, the Starlink uh, uh, V2 satellites are, are very large and, uh, at, and too big to fit in a Falcon 9, uh, but the, uh, we, are, we are actually looking at, at an interim uh, solution, which is like a, a sort of Starlink V2 Mini that would um, maybe launch uh, if, if uh, Starlink, if, if the Starship is program uh, is delayed uh, longer than expected, would launch a sort of a small, a smaller uh, Starlink V2 kind of Mini that would fit on a Falcon 9. If you remember back a few weeks ago, I reported that the FCC had done a 180 on Starlink's 885 million infrastructure award, denying SpaceX their spoils while claiming the service was still too expensive and not good enough for customers yet. Well, the FCC's commissioner, Republican Brendan Carr, took to Twitter to express his frustration with his own agency's decision to do this. He wrote FCC leadership made this reverse decision without a vote or authorization from commissioners. Quote, I was surprised to find out by an FCC press release issued earlier this month that agency leadership had suddenly reversed course on an 885 million infrastructure award that Elon Musk Starlink won in 2020 to provide high-speed internet service to unconnected Americans. The agency's decision here mirrors the administration's broader set of infrastructure missteps by costing taxpayer dollars while leaving rural communities behind. Let's go, Pedo Joe. Brandon. <laughs> Those last words are mine. And also from me, a word about our sponsor, The Epic Times. You guys watch my videos because, at least in part, you're all about getting accurate, to the point SpaceX news. Well, if you want more reporting you can trust concerning not just US and world news that other organizations won't even bother covering, but also other breaking stories in science and health and nutrition, I highly recommend you check out the Epic Times using the link on screen and provided in the description below. They're giving you, my viewers, a special offer, two months for just $1. So why not give truthful, fact-based, unbiased reporting a try? Yes, every individual is biased, but true journalists recognize their bias and try their best to counter it in their work. I don't do that because my pro SpaceX bias is why most of you are here. I'm not a journalist. I'm a dork with a selfie stick. SpaceX's chief engineer himself, the Musk man, was recently intrigued by one of the Epic Times' stories. Hmm, gee, right after they began sponsoring the show. Coincidence? I think not! Clearly, he's a smart guy with good taste, as are all of you, obviously. So if you haven't yet, go to epictim.es slash spaceeccentric and subscribe for one buck. But now it's time for today's informative and educational honorable mention. The August 2022 edition of the State of Space Industrial Base Report, written by officials from the U.S. Space Force and other DoD entities, in part warned that the Chinese Communist Party intends to take the high ground from the United States and may do so by 2032. Anybody who knows anything about the CCP and geopolitics understands why this would be a terrible thing for the free world. And so the report argues that the U.S. should use our greatest strength by embracing the private sector. While I do believe for matters of national security, it can be beneficial for the military and agencies like NASA to be customers of private industry, just one of a number of customers, as the great Jim Bridenstine often repeated. Public-private partnerships, however, remain a threat to free market capitalism and something to be avoided, thus we end up just like the CCP anyway, where the government dominates and controls private business and thus the lives of its citizens. We've recently seen this kind of public-private rot spread to big pharma and big tech, giving off major commie vibes. Generally speaking, best just to remove government from the equation and allow innovators to innovate. But I do recognize space is the high ground and therefore an issue of national security. And if the federal government can't protect its citizens from foreign threats, what's it good for? Space is also a dangerous domain and one in which NASA is the leading expert. So it's reasonable for government to act as a nitpicky customer in this industry, so long as they stay on topic. Which is what they're currently doing with Blue Origin and Sierra Space as the two companies build the orbital reef. It just passed NASA's system definition review so the companies can further develop the design. As the International Space Station comes to an end, NASA will use private commercial space stations to continue the nation's constant presence in orbit. But Orbital Reef will also be used for commerce and tourism. 
And I really see no problem with that, government being a customer for the sake of securing our spot on the high ground. It's when the Fed starts demanding companies be more equitable and woke in order to do business or use a business to do the government's unconstitutional bidding, a dangerous line has been crossed. Well, that's all for today. Thanks for watching. And thank you supporters for backing this channel. It's because of them that this show still exists. And I do get asked from time to time how you can become a big Falcon representative supporter of the channel and get your name on screen here. Well, you just need to sign up as a member on Locals for $25 a month. You can also click the join button below on YouTube. But Locals is where the eccentric community and extra content is at. Okay. Have a nominal weekend. And until next time, Godspeed. Okay.